Hello and welcome to Inside Steampunk Free, guys. My name is Michelle Cornwall Jordan and I am your host. I'm so excited that I am bringing to you another great Inside Steampunk Free. We're going to the state, into the punk world, and talk to authors and artists and makers and all those who love the genre. Tonight I'm speaking with Pip. Val uh, Valentine and T. Morris. Uh, they're going to chat with us about their releases, their writing um, processes, their love for steampunk, and they're married. So how all of that works out? <laughs> it works out. <laughs> we try to explain that. We have to, we have to trade off gizmos. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome to the show. How are you both tonight? Thank you for joining doing good you know it's it's just another great night to strap into a corset and wear a funny hat we we, 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 we do this all the time yeah it's just another monday yeah yep. <laughs> when when, when penny dreadful's on this is what we wear <laughs> <laughs> well the gifts to um to begin the show how about you just uh tell about yourselves go ahead baby um well we're writers of steampunk and fantasy and science fiction i maybe my accent's still there. I was actually born and raised in New Zealand and I've lived here in Virginia with this person uh, for, <laughs> for the last six years. Okay. And um, we've been writing since uh, Steampunk since 2010. 2010. 2010, 20, uh, yeah. the, the, I think the, the first- book came out in 2010, but we've been writing before that. Yeah. And uh, so, yes, I, I'm, I've, I've lived all my life here in the United States. I've, I've lived in, I'm, I'm living in Virginia right now, obviously with my wife, Pip Valentine. I've been writing uh, science fiction and fantasy since uh, 2001 and uh, got into steampunk. Well, actually, what, what brought me into steampunk was the photography of uh, J.R. Blackwell. Uh, she was, she's, she's a steampunk based out of, uh, just out of Philadelphia. And she and her husband, Jared Axelrod, the two of them were doing steampunk one day on their Flickr account. And I said, what is this? And <laughs> I began to figure out that I, I grandfathered myself into steampunk, not knowing it was steampunk at the time. It was just called science fiction back then. <laughs> and, uh, and, and now we're, we're writing it professionally and we, we, we love it. Uh, the first book came out, I believe in 2010. Yeah. Uh, and now we're getting ready to release the fifth book. Wow. Um, the fifth book is is going to be coming out uh, in June. So by the time this airs, uh, be out. it should be out. It'll be out. All right, that's incredible. Well, I like to always. We know how you um, found your way to sing punk, but I always like to start at the beginning. Um, have you always loved writing, both of you, or was it a newfound passion? Did you start at that time? <laughs> we have different stories about that one. <laughs> um, for me, I was. Uh, my dad was a is a big science fiction and fantasy reader so i am a pretty fast reader like he is so i went through all of his books like as a teenager and then i got to the end of all of his books and so i started writing um but i've been writing professionally since 97 but what i reconnected with one of my friends on facebook from like back when i was 13 and she was like oh yeah i remember you you had this little green journal and and you were walking around, writing away in it. And she's like, I'm glad that took out well for you. <laughs> and as far as, 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 far as uh, it goes for me, I was a professional actor once upon a time. Uh, oh. I actually studied theater and mass communication at James Madison University. Okay. And, and I, was, I was planning to be a professional actor. And it was during a show. I was actually in, in the, sh in, in a, I was the lead in a, in a show at the time. And I was, I was simultaneously writing my first book while while performing the title role of this play and it was it, anytime I, I basically went off stage wrote and as i'm waiting for my cue somebody the the the, the cast and that was the that was the great thing about uh, about being in the theater that they loved art of any kind so when they saw me working on this novel they would say t 15 minutes till places and then and they look and <laughs> five minutes till places and i'm typing away and they said t places now <laughs> and I would do Command S, run up, and I'd hit my mark. I never. Wow. Missed um, so so I. But you chose two careers that are just rife with rejection. Yeah, so. rife. With, <laughs> yeah, I was ready for rejection because I was I was an actor. But um, it, it, it came to a choice. I, I I'd reached a crossroads, and I said, Well, am I going to be an actor? Am I going to be a, a writer? And I, I I went on ahead and chose a writer's profession, but I still get my actor's kick whenever I do podcasting. 
Uh, and I also do audiobooks. So nice. based on based on podcasting, fiction, and audiobooks, I, st- I still get my I actors fix in there. Yeah, I still have my <laughs> hand in there. Very cool. Now, why did you make that choice? What, what gears you more towards writing versus the acting? Well, I think the 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 biggest the the, the biggest jump with uh, w- the the reason I took that jump was mainly because I found that I was moving forward. Uh, a bit faster as a writer than I was as an actor. Um, also, you can be, I, I have met and worked with some of the most talented actors that you've never heard of. <laughs> and, and that's, it's, it's the honest truth, you know? And, and whereas with, with writing, you, you know, I've, I've met some writers who still have not been published, but you can, you know, particularly with podcasting, you can get your fiction out a lot easier Mm-hmm. And um, to some extent, yeah, you can do that with acting, but with writing, uh, I, I think it. I think it was just a, It was a. It was a. It was a, a. It was the right path for me to choose, mm-hmm. because as an actor, the 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 coolest thing that I had done as an actor was that I was on Homicide: Life on the Street. I was in an episode of that. Okay. Um, you're probably too young to remember that show. Um, but at but least you had the, your arm also done up like that. Do I? And the and the episode. Of oh yeah, the yeah. I, my, my arm had been broken because I, I I'd broken it the, the the week before my callback at, at a at the Renaissance. Now you got it in steampunk. Um, now I got it in steampunk. <laughs> but the um, but the nicest pl- the the that was the most exotic place I'd been, which well, was just Baltimore. outside. No, just outside of Baltimore, <laughs> one of the seediest parts of Baltimore. I wouldn't go there during the daylight, and we were shooting an episode of Homicide: Life on the Street. Yeah. Versus in my first year as an as an author. I traveled to, I, I traveled to Seattle, I traveled to Texas, I, uh, I traveled, I'm sorry, uh, I traveled to Fort Worth, I traveled to New Orleans. I was, I, I found there were more opportunities for me as a writer than there were for me as an actor. Now, this was before YouTube really took off. So mm-hmm. chances that could have changed. <laughs> if you only waited a few years, you could have If I waited a, a few star. years, I would have been, I would have been a YouTube star. <laughs> I, I, would, I, I would have been the male Felicia Day. But Instead, I'm more than okay with writing because, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, we're parents and the acting lifestyle can be a, a really tough one. It can be very, very nomadic, but um, I, I still, I, it doesn't mean that At least that our I daughter stop. knows where we are. We're sitting on the couch. Exactly. <laughs> but, the, but the thing is, I've never, I don't think I've ever really stopped acting because um, whenever I do an audio book, whenever I do podcasting, whenever I proof one of our manuscripts, I give the characters voices. Um, I sometimes in fight scenes have to act out the fight scenes and it just, it just helps me as a writer. So I don't think I've ever, and, and I remember, I remember I was at a science fiction convention with Lonnie Tupu. Um, I don't know if you know the actor or not, but he was, uh, he played the voice of pilot and, and Captain Crace from the TV show Farscape. Okay. And, yes. And yes. Him, yes. You know, Same dropper. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> well, we were doing a workshop together as a matter hey. of fact. And, um, and uh, uh, I remember saying to him, I said, yeah, I gave up acting to be a writer. And he nearly, he nearly uh, decked me. He leaned forward. I mean, he nose to nose me. He's like, you never stop being an actor, T. You will always be an actor. And when you're ready, the stage will be waiting for you. you, you don't ever stop. <laughs> well, we do have stages as writers when we go to conventions and stuff like that. So, you know, it's not, it never goes nah, away. It never goes away. It never goes away. And I think that steampunk within itself has a bit of theatrics, you know. <laughs> Right. Let me think on that. Just well, it's certainly bit. got costumes and characters. Yeah, yes, it, does. it, it is does. Does. It really does. Uh, and we definitely want. I really do want to touch base on your podcasting and you know all of that that you have going on. And I, I really do want to talk a little bit more about that and your travels because I'm, I'm in Fort Worth. And oh. yes, and New Orleans is one of my favorite places. So I did, oh. we definitely want to come back to that. But let's talk about your series, your books. Um, without giving any spoilers, what is your series? What is it about? Mm-hmm. And what did the idea originate? Oh, jeez. Uh, okay, <laughs> I'll, go, I'll go with the uh, what is it about? Yeah, what is it about? Okay, it, the, uh, the series is called The Ministry of Peculiar Occurrences. And it is a steampunk spy organization that nice. keeps an eye on the strange, the unusual, the bizarre. You know, you've got secret societies, you've got a, a weird artifacts. Uh, and in the very first book, we meet uh, Eliza Braun, who is a New Zealand secret agent. She loves blowing things up and she's a bit of a, 
adrenaline junkie, I guess you could say. <laughs> and in the first book, she gets demoted because she blew the wrong thing up. <laughs> and uh, she gets transferred down to the archives where she meets Wellington Thornhill Books, who is the archivist down there. And in the first book, uh, she gets a bit bored and she tries to drag him into adventures. And on, as the series goes along, he gets more into going on adventures with her. Yeah. And, um, and his story, his story also unfolds as well. And, uh, and in the, the, uh, we, we've described the series in so many different ways. We describe it as James Bond in a corset meets the, <laughs> um, which I think is a great way to describe it. Uh, we've, we, we have a lot of fun with the, with spy craft. We've, we've had a lot of fun with, um, we, we've had to delve into a lot of supernatural, um, uh, folklore of the of the of the 19th century and the only thing we haven't done yet there's only one thing we haven't done yet and we're waiting until until episode number 50 to do it and i'm, I'm i've driven I've, I've drawn a hard line in the sand but for our <laughs> for our podcast the ministry uh the tales from the archives uh show number 50 will feature some sort of extraterrestrial activity <laughs> Everything else, everything else has been ghosts, mummy. We've had ghosts, we've had mummies, we've had mad scientists, we've had uh, cursed artifacts. We've had, which is great. I mean, it's been it's been fantastic. But the the whole the whole idea of the Ministry of Peculiar Occurrences is a very odd it's occurrence. A, a really weird genesis. I I started writing a book set in present day okay. that introduced this Ministry of Peculiar Occurrences, and. My plan was to go on ahead and write this book. Which you've never done. Which I never did. <laughs> and Pip's idea was, let's do a podcast for pay. Because this was one of the vehicles that... It was like that, 2009. It was 2008, 2009. And people started experiment, spending, experimenting with, with premium podcasts or podcasts right. for pay. Never really and, took and off. never took <laughs> off. Shocker that. And we've been podcasting since 2005. So we've seen all the renaissances. We love hearing people, especially now when they say, oh, yeah, it's such a great community. And it's great to know that podcasting has been around for 10 years. Sorry, bro. It's been around for 11 years. <laughs> Apple picked it up in 20, a, a year later. Right. That's a, that's for an, that's yes. for, that's a different discussion altogether. But, you digress. but I digress. So in 2008, 2009, um, Pip's like, let's do this podcast for pay, and we'll do the backstory of how the ministry was founded. Let's do it in the 19th century. So we, so we said, let's do hardcore steampunk. And I said, great. So we were writing it, and then um, Pip's agent contacted her and said, this steampunk idea, how far are you into it? And, and we, we were like, oh, we're nearly done. We lied. <laughs> and said, we're nearly done. <laughs> we're nearly done, right? And the next there. thing we knew, within, within a year, there was a bidding war for the very first book. Wow. And and that so basically this this what is now going to become a six book uh it the basically this six book series which features a novella which features um when we're done it's going to be over 50 short stories in podcast form nearly 70 stories if you count other short stories and anthologies and uh, and the print anthology and don't forget the role playing game and the role playing game <laughs> All this was born of a book I never got. I <laughs> one. So that I is. Think the, it, I think it makes perfect sense that we called it the Ministry of Peculiar Occurrences no because it was kidding. very peculiar. No how it all kidding. Happened. It really, it really was. And, uh, we're really, we're really proud of not just the way it's it's evolved, but also in the the, the fan support that we got just in the last Kickstarter alone. Uh, the feedback we've gotten on uh, on on the on the role playing game and 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 it's it's just it's 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 overwhelming. But at the same time, it just it, whenever I hear people say steampunk is dead, it's like it's not dead. It just hasn't had that mainstream knockout hit yet. Mm -hmm. right. Yet, right. yet, yet, because it is going mainstream. Don't you believe? Yeah. Um, it, um, I've noticed between 2012, 13, somewhere around in there to now, it's more mainstream. Um, shows are coming out or it's we more find we, we're having to less tell people because yeah. when we first started off with the first yes. book we spent a lot of time people going what is steampunk and, yeah. <laughs> and uh there's less and less of that as the times time has gone along so now our, our the page on uh on our website the ministry of, uh sorry ministry of peculiar occurrences dot com um uh, on that website the, the number one page that is the one link that is always clicked is what is steampunk? 
which we're okay with. And right. we, we get we get hundreds of hits a day just on that page alone. Mm -hmm. that's and, and that's fine because we're really proud of, and we're always updating that page too because it feels like that there are new examples that we can give and there's new, there, there are new photographs you can put up. But, we, uh, but when, when people visit it, it's, it's a real simple, okay, here's the short version of the answer, here's the meatier version of the answer, and if you go, if you scroll down even further, here's where you get all the details. <laughs> dive. Right from who came up with the term all the way up to our books. So we just went, we did, we did small, medium, large, boom. <laughs> Incredible. Now, who, um, who are you with? Is uh, your publisher? Who have we not been with? That's the real question. <laughs> who have we not been with? We were, uh, the first books came out with Harper Voyager. Mm -hmm. uh, then they came out with Ace. T has sold a short story in the series to Bane Bain Books. books. Um, we, oh, uh, uh, what's it called? Alliteration, Alli Alliteration Inc. Alliteration Inc., yeah. I think so. Um, there's a couple of books that uh, one of them I was in was for Steampunk World. And then we kickstarted the last two books. So I think we're up to, did I miss Not, any? Yeah, yeah. You, you also missed Galileo Games. Oh, they're yes. The, they're the people who publish the game. They do the role play. Um, uh, the 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 name of the publisher escapes me mm -hmm. but uh there is a publisher in the uk that bought uh, our, our our short story silver linings and that's coming out in 2017 it's called clockwork scarab and it's steampunk entirely set in egypt yes. and uh and so uh i want to say we've been around the block including, <laughs> including the stuff we've self-published I want to say we, the Ministry of Peculiar Occurrences has been blessed to appear in seven different <laughs> publishers. Incredible. And do you find the reason, because I've, I've gone into bookstores, you know, I'm looking for steampunk, and it's hard to find it. You'll find it, but in odd places. And do you think yes. yeah. this, Because they don't know where, they they don't don't know know where, where to show it. it. Yes. I think that's um, what it is. I, I, mean, I mean, theoretically, if you go, um, if you're listing a book on Amazon, it's under... Science, science fiction. fiction science fiction right but there is also steampunk where they deal with magic and yeah. so sometimes it's not set on earth right. sometimes there's steampunk that's um more fantasy based so i think yeah for booksellers it's a little confusing about where to put it and then there are, and then there are romance publishers that publish uh oh, yeah. steampunk and is and it they, paranormal or something this publisher is a romance publisher so they got to go into <laughs> they got to go into the romance section right which which again we're okay with Yes, because we're finding that um, you know the readers readers don't really care what the genre they just want is. The steampunk. They just want a really good story, and if it's steampunk, if it happens to be steampunk, um, you know, Mazel tov. Uh, we, we just got back from the uh, RT Co Book Lovers Convention. Yes, I and, love that. Oh yeah, it was it was a great time. We had a blast there, and there was a, there was someone who actually stumbled into our our panel by accident, but she was so taken with the subject matter and how we were presenting it, she said, I'm gonna track down these authors books. I didn't, I didn't think I would like steampunk, but after listening to these guys, I wanna read <laughs> We will read get steampunk. them one at a time. <laughs> one at a time, one at a time. And, one at a time. Yes. and I think, uh, you know, it's, now speak, let's go ahead and do the definition. What is steampunk? Okay, <laughs> okay. If you go in first, okay. I'll catch up. Simple, you. simple, like short answer. Okay. Short answer. Science fiction set in the 19th century. Note, I did not say Victorian, the, the, the Victorian era. I said the 19th, 19th century, century because the 19th century was happening everywhere. Now, yes. that's the real short answer. Ah, where, where the main technology is powered by steam. Yes. yes. Okay. okay, so that's, that's your short answer. <laughs> now, now the medium sized answer. Okay. <laughs> let's say, let's say, now picture all of our modern conveniences, mm -hmm. picture cell phones, picture iPads, picture computers, but then give them that 19th century flair and power it all by steam. And then keep in mind that these are worlds that are based around Jules Verne, HG Wells and Mary Shelley. That's steampunk. Cool. Very now cool. I'm not even going to go into the no, large. That, 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 that becomes like a two-hour. That becomes a two-hour <laughs> symposium, which I will be giving. I'll be giving a one-hour version of that symposium uh, for um, for uh, writers' digest. Yes, you're doing. Steve They're Pop hiring the me. This, yeah, Steve, that uh, is so cool. Digest has hired me to do an uh, online webinar, and I'll make sure to get. Uh, well, it's going to be done by the time this airs. 
but I believe it'll be available for download. Mm -hmm. And when it's available for download, you can go on ahead. You're going to deep dive them into Yeah, Steampunk. I'm going to deep dive people into Steampunk and talk about not just how it should, in my opinion, my humble opinion, how it should be written, <laughs> but also talk about some of the pros and cons of trying to sell Steampunk in the modern publishing market. Right. And I think this is, I think so many people that I've met and I'll hear, what is it? But they are attracted to it. They, oh, yeah. as you said, oh, yeah. once they hear about it, they like it. It's kind of, oh my goodness. So I think this is awesome. And, and your books and your world sounds incredible. Um, question for you. How do you come up with those great gadgets? I think I've spoken with so many uh, steampunk or punk authors and they have different ways they come up with the gadgetry. Gadgets. I can't even say the word. The gadgets. Right. <laughs> Well, we certainly we certainly get a lot of inspiration from media because T is a huge. I mean, we're both James Bond fans, but T is a huge James no, Bond. No, I'm, I'm um, a, a Christmas. Many Christmases, not many Christmases. About two or three Christmases ago, you got her the whole parents. Set. Her parents gave me the Blu-ray remastered All 50th of anniversary James <laughs> Bond set. You can just put that on and think. How and, was that? And, if that was powered by steam, how yeah, would that Yeah, and that work? was exactly what we did. I mean, the inspir uh, for example, in the third book, Dawn's Early Light, we introduce uh, Wellington's car. And it's been something that you see him building between book one and book two. And finally, in book three, you see it. So when you first see the car, there are nods to Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Ah! But, then, <laughs> but then by the end, the, you find out that the car has has missiles. It has it has a smoke screen. It has it has. Uh, now you're in James and, Bond. And now now I'm in Goldfinger territory. You know, and, <laughs> and basically I took I took everything I loved of Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, and then I took his Aston Martin DB5 from merged Goldfinger, them together. merged them together, and that was when I came up with what what became called the Aries Mark One. Now the oh, what? I you're good. The microphone. You're good. Um, the other, the other thing we do is uh, look at history for inspiration. Oh, yeah. There was a lot of cool uh, gadgets that were made or thought about being made. Like, uh, for example, in the archives, Wellington uses an analytical engine, um, which was thought about and conceived by Babbage, but he never got around to making, making it. it. Right. So you kind of leap off from there and think, what would happen if he had got the funds to make it and well, that was the know, basically the first computer. And that was the premise of Steampunk right there is that what if Babbage's difference engine really caught on? And that's, and that, that's where we run with it. Um, and then there, there are gadgets from the 19th century in our, in our, uh, in our area, in, in the Washington DC area, there's the, uh, the International Spy Museum and they have spy gadgets from the 19th century. How cool. One of them was a ring that actually had four bullets in it. It was a ring gun. And we've seen it up close and, and we see where the trigger is and we basically say, okay, we'll take that and we pump it up to the next level. Yeah, that and is that's, so cool. Push it up a little bit. Yeah, and what's really funny though is that there's been some, there have been some gadgets that we've brought in that we haven't had to tweak. So then people try to, they play this game when they read our books, they go, okay, was this real, a real thing or did you make that up? And, and then you've, it, it reminds us of a, of a podcast. That there's a podcast that has a game called Show Nuff a Hail No. And <laughs> they play that game with our gadgets. They go, they go okay, see, this gadget, Show Nuff or Hail No. And it just goes from there. Yeah. I love it. Oh, my goodness. Well, are you – traditional in your thoughts on, on steampunk because you know there is there there are those that are traditional or those that said okay well you know you can put steampunk in the wild west or oh. you know, the dystopian setting versus traditional blah 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 you know new york or london. london right right it was that great it was the, the <laughs> great line from um from uh the guild when uh when one of the fans when, when, when one of the guild looks over at Comic-Con and they go, who, who are those fans? And, and steampunks. Yeah, and they were steampunks. He goes, oh, they're steampunks, the Euro trash of fandom. <laughs> we, got a chance to, we, we got a chance to go to Felicia Day and say to her, that was our favorite <laughs> line in the entire series. <laughs> He's just like, no, 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 don't apologize. And, and well, no, we're definitely not traditional. No, we're not. No, we're not. In the first season alone, in the first season yeah. alone, I mean, in the books, I mean, what do we got? Uh, the first two books are in London. The uh, third, one, third book is in uh, America. Yeah. The, the fourth, fourth one book, hops everywhere. It comes around, it goes around Europe, it comes back to London. 
And then in the fifth book, we're going to India and Russia. Yes. So, uh, and then the podcasts we've done, uh, African Africa, steam, so African steampunk, African steampunk um, China, Chinese, Japan, Japan, Thailand, Thailand, New Zealand. Um, we haven't done an Australian. I'm going to write. Yeah, Australian you got to write the Australian one. one. Um, Australian yeah. So we, I mean, it's fascinating to think about how steampunk would merge with col other cultures mm -hmm. and what they would create. You know, and how the, and technology. how the technology would change their their mm -hmm. culture, and that's that's um, that's been a lot of fun to play with. And again. It, it's where it's where I think that yes, I think it is kind of limiting when when authors say, well, to be steampunk, it's got to be set in England, it's got to be set in London. It's like, look, the last time I checked, the British Empire covered a lot of ground, and that ground was way beyond the borders. Oh, we mustn't forget the Canadian steampunk. Oh, we've done we've done Canadian steampunk. <laughs> we've done we've done South American steampunk. Yes. Uh, I mean, we we've, we've had a lot of fun playing around in these cultures, and then also not just playing in the cultures, but also have inviting other authors to play in the cultures so they can look at the political climate of what things were like in South America in the 19th century, what things were like in Russia, um, which was something that we touched on in, uh, in, 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 the, in the Ghost Rebellion. Mm -hmm. And it's been, the, the thing about the 19th century was it wasn't just happening in the yes, United States <laughs> and, and, and it, it was happening all, all over the world. So why limit yourself to two territories? Why limit yourself to England and, to England and the United States? You know, you, you know, push your, I mean, that's what authors are supposed to do. They're supposed to push themselves and they're supposed to push the boundaries. Right. And so, so um, if, if you would say, are we traditional? I would say absolutely not. And I think it reflects. <laughs> Go everywhere. Writing. Yeah. Yes. I love that. Very cool. Well, how about other types of punk? Diesel, uh -huh. fiber, all of that. Do you write in any of those other types of punks or will you? I just, I just released my first diesel punk. That's right. I just released my first diesel punk. Yeah. Although some, some might argue it would be, it would be Tesla punk. But um, so let me explain. So um, I've been talking about for the past two years, I've been talking about doing this, this, this um, uh, steampunk fairy tale. And uh, we're, we're, we did other, we did three others. Yeah, we've, we've done three others. He did uh, Aladdin and his infernal device. Yep. Uh, I did uh, Little Clockwork Mermaid and uh, Wild Swans. Or Wild well, Swans it was version. called Mechanical, Mechanical Wings. Mechanical Wings. Right. But then you were really slagging off. I know, was really right? slagging off. Because, <laughs> because, and then, and then when, in this recent Kickstarter that we had, I put it up as a stretch goal to release it in audio. Yeah, we made and, him do it. And, we, and we, we made it. So I went on ahead and wrote Little Red Flying Hood. And I set it in, uh, I set it near the border of, of the Germanic Empire and France. Um, During World War One. There were, it was set in World War One. And Scarlet was, uh, yeah, Scarlet, Scarlet O'Quinn. Scarlet O'Quinn, yeah. Scarlet Quinn, you're right. Scarlet Quinn. I know his book um, better than he does. <laughs> I'm looking at the other book, honey. Um, but Scarlet Quinn, uh, she is, a, she's flying a, um, she's flying an old prop engine plane. And uh, they give her a new plane that uh, is half diesel, half electric. And it's the most advanced thing the allies have. But what, what, the tr what, what they discover is, is that this one, the aces of aces, the big bad wolf, is flying in a black Fokker um, experimental prototype plane. And the, the plane is entirely electric. So it's oh. silent. It's whisper silent. So and cool. and we so yeah that's that's a it's a version of tesla it, and it's 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 like part electro punk, punk. yeah yeah <laughs> tesla punk. but my problem with with when people say oh that's diesel punk or that's retro punk or that's atom punk or that when you start get or or the the, the goofier ones oh that's sandal punk yeah. that's sand punk and i think the worst one the one that really turns me off the most rice punk yeah, which is, which is steampunk set in Japan. It's like, wow, yeah, everyone's a little racist. Oh, I mean, wow. Really inappropriate. Never. Yeah, yeah um, I think uh, Paolo uh, Bagalucci, the guy who did the wind-up girl, uh -huh. um, yes. that was set in Asia. So mm -hmm. people were saying, yeah, that's the best rice punk I've ever read. And I'm just shaking my no, head at it him. it wasn't. It was more biopunk, I would have yeah. actually said. But the point I'm getting at is that I personally think that when you start chopping up the 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 – when you start chopping up the, the genre that much, mm -hmm. instead of explaining to people what steampunk is, it starts to make, it starts to muddy the waters. Yes. So then you, so, so, you know, I'm, I'm begrudgingly starting to come around and start saying, yeah, I've also written diesel punk. And then maybe I could say I could do atom punk, 
but when you start getting into the into really trying to find something and slapping the word punk on it, I think it really does dilute the brand. Mm -hmm. So you have to be real careful what kind of punk you're you're oh, representing. All right, I did write cyberpunk. You've like written cyberpunk, was, yeah. yeah. Written cyberpunk, you called, keep forgetting about that. Yeah, I yeah. <laughs> think I'm sure I've done. Yeah, I did uh, digital magic, which was a story about a cyberpunk librarian. <laughs> Uh, very cool. That was a few years ago now. That was a few years so that ago. probably primed me for steampunk, I think. Do you two write together separate, separate projects, or do you have a I mean, how does that work? And and well, what is your writing schedule? Do you write when you ever you can in pockets or you have a dedicated schedule? You can't see behind us, but we're actually in front of a giant whiteboard that we painted yeah, on the walls. Um right here, there's a, <laughs> the, right what you what you don't see just here behind, just behind us is a um is a yeah, we, we basically took this wall. And we used whiteboard paint, and this is our this is our idea wall. We try and, and come down every wall. Sunday and try and sort out what we're both doing. Right, because we do write separate stuff, but we also write together. So it, it can be a bit of a juggling act to keep and, an eye some, on what the other person yeah. is doing. And, and sometimes we, uh, you wind up being drafted into a project even when you don't <laughs> don't, don't know about it. Like uh, Pip wanted to do a, um, she said, I really want to do a YA spinoff <laughs> for. Um, for the Ministry of Peculiar Occurrences featuring um, our version of the Baker Street Irregulars, which we call the Ministry Seven. Even though there's eight of them. Yeah, even though there's eight of them. <laughs> which is also <laughs> yeah. but, um, but the But Pip, Pip uh, showed me like the first scene and I sat down with it. She said, tell me what you think of the scene. And I, and, I, and I started editing some notes and I wound up doubling the word count of this one chapter. And she said, why don't you just write it with me? And I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll do that. But just, um, just path of least resistance. Yeah. You know. But Pip has also written two manuscripts on her own, uh, both epic fantasy. I would I would describe. Uh, you know. Um, well, actually, no. What, would you Would you say historical oh, fantasy? I, would be, um, I tend to like writing uh, historical right. fantasy. Like I'm, I've got two projects. One of them is set in Hollywood in the 1910s, 1920s. Oh, I'm nice. Like and the other one I'm working on is That's set. epic fantasy. That's that is not, well, actually it might be romance, paranormal romance. Immortal project? It might be. No, no, no. Oh no, Iron Lily. You're thinking of Iron yeah, Lily. Yeah, I've got so many projects. Yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> the, the Iron Lily is set in, it's about an, uh, a strong woman in 1890s New York City. So it's, the gilded age and, and she's very unconventional and interesting. And then I've got, uh, I've got an, um, I've got a, an urban fantasy that I'm working on. Uh, I call it uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer meets Hannibal. <laughs> and that's, that's called Wolf in the Fold. And then there's another property that I'm, that I'm, I'm working on. I have to, I have to flush it out a little, a, a little bit, but uh, it's, it's called Black Star Rising. And that is a, uh, it's space opera. Uh, and it's gonna, there's going to be some romance. Uh, I've got a female captain. Um, I, I describe it as the the crew of the crew of Serenity cracked the Da Vinci Code in outer space. <laughs> so that's that's the, we like those to have a project. lot of projects. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's why we need a giant whiteboard. That's why we need the whiteboard. <laughs> that's why we need the whiteboard. And the only reason that it looks empty now is because we had just erased uh, all the notes from um, the Ghost from, from the Ghost Rebellion, which was funny because whenever we had friends over. Who were fans of the book? They'd be like, Ooh. they would, I, they would avert their eyes. <laughs> they would not look. They didn't want to be spoiled in any way, shape, or form. Well, actually, very shortly, uh, in the end of June, we're going to start writing up for Operation the Endgame, final the book sixth for the and ministry. final book. Well, for Wellington for this Eliza, series, for this, for, for these two agents, for Wellington. Never Eliza. say never. We just love one, one more book. We love it so much. We're always going to be one more book. I think. Very cool. Tell us about uh, the podcast. So um, how, what would a reader or a listener um, expect when tuning in? Well, the, the podcasts were done to support the novels going out. Okay. So they are short stories. They're all set in the same world as the ministry, um, but the ministry spans a number of years. So some of them are earlier and some of them are even after right. uh, the ministry. Some of them have uh, characters from the novels cross over into the short stories. Um, it's it's a great way to sort of fill in the backstory of some characters or, uh, for example, we had a, a bit where Eliza talks about her previous partner in the ministry, uh, Harrison Thorne, and she talks about all that thing that happened in Paris. And we don't really talk about what happened in Paris, but in the short story you find out, you know, you go back in time and see what, what actually occurred. 
you also get um, you also get some stories like uh, there was a there was another story again from the first season where um, where you uh, 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 Wellington and Wellington and Eliza are in the are in the archives and Eliza happens to break uh, a vase and it was part of a set of seven vases and what what she finds out later was is that the the seven vases when they were put together they made a map to El Dorado and she broke vase number seven so someone actually wrote the short story on how the ministry got hold of these seven vases that lead to El Dorado and the the first the first season. When, when we wrote the book, we were, we were, when we wrote the first book, we had started season one of Tales from the Archives, and there were a couple of nods to the first book. But then when we wrote the second book, we started referencing things that were happening in the podcast as well. Um, I call it, I call it the, 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 Marvel, the Marvel rule, yeah. where which is great about Marvel movies, yes, yeah. all the nods to all yeah. the other movies to show that it's all the same universe. So we started dropping Easter eggs to a point where in the fourth book, uh, we actually, uh, we, 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 we lovingly there's dedicated. A there's a group scene. Yeah, there's, there, there are group where scenes. Where all these people from the short stories are they like, all oh, come hi. They're all come, <laughs> they all come together and they all reference, they, they, reference the, they reference the podcast. They reference other short stories that appear in other books. And it was, it was my, I, 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 called, I called that scene my Marvel moment. Because then, you know, with anybody who had been tracking the season uh, or the previous seasons of Tales from the Archives, they go, oh, I get that, I get that, I get that, I get that. And to make it all interconnected like that, I'm a sucker for that kind of stuff. So, um, so, so I'm, I'm, I, I love doing that. And um, Well, I think it also, uh, it, it works to expand, like if you've already read the novels, it expands the universe. And if you haven't read the and novels. And if you haven't, it's a taster. It's, yeah. And a, in fact, when we hand out like bookmarks and uh, uh, business cards at conventions, we often, you know, if they're like, oh, I haven't really tried steampunk before and I don't really know, then we say, well, if you like free, they love the word free, free <laughs> audio fiction, go and try it. Go and listen to a couple of episodes. And if you, and if you like what you hear, you're going to like the books. You're going to like the books. So, and now I, we say that, but the funny thing is the books are actually lighter than some of the so short no, stories. Some of the short, some of the stories, yeah, yeah, they get they get kind of creepy, uh, and then there's some short stories that are just they're just uh, hell of fun, uh, and then um, we uh, we we also have uh, the occasional Christmas special, so we do Christmas specials, and just like Doctor Who, just like Doctor Who. <laughs> uh, if you're gonna if you're gonna take lessons from take take them from the best. So we started doing uh, Christmas specials, and two of those two of those uh, uh, of those stories have actually been published elsewhere. And the one that we mentioned with Bain Books, that one actually was was the first one published where uh, Wellington and Eliza uh, go ghost hunting at the at the, the domicile of Ebenezer Scrooge, and we had a blast uh, doing. So as you can tell, it's it's a lighthearted series. Yes, mostly, it's a very, it most, mostly. mostly it's a lighthearted series. Yeah. So when you're in the podcast, you're just you're listening to the story. Do you do the voices? Well, sometimes sometimes it's us. Sometimes it's the person if they wrote the story. Um, we we like spice it up with some um, sound effects and some and some music underneath, and uh, we do a little introduction for it. But usually, it's the person who wrote the right. story is reading. We try oh. to encourage, yeah, we try to encourage the the author to do it in their own voice, and and that's been a lot of fun to to see because a lot of authors uh, they've uh, so, some of them have have enjoyed it so much they actually started their own podcast because of it. That so is that's incredible. Kind of nice. That's nice to do. So you opened up your world and then they write the stories mm -hmm. in your world. Oh, that's, that's incredible. Very, very cool. Um, you mentioned the conferences. Um, do you do many, I, I know the book conferences, but do you do any steampunk, you know, you're just there, you know. Quite a few. Yes. Quite a few. Quite <laughs> do you a few. have a role? Do you have an, a persona? Not really. I mean, okay. if we did one, we would call ourselves the journalists from the ministry. Um, we're going uh, this weekend to the Steampunk World's Fair in Piscataway, New Jersey. Uh, it's been a few years since we've been there, but it's a great event. Uh, we've been we, one of our favorite events is um, Steampunk Unlimited, which is held in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. So it's an Amish country, but they have this wonderful heritage railway there. So they have you have the steam trains and they have um they've had Abney Park and uh, Steampunk Giraffe, 
So it's uh, Frenchie and the Punk. Frenchie and the Punk. They yeah. have a lot of great things going on there, and this will be our fourth. Yeah, yeah. we we actually kicked okay. off the the Steampunk Unlimited event, and it's just been getting bigger and bigger every time we go. And it's it's a it's a wonderful event because you got people walking around in in gear like this. You know, Thomas Williford is a, a, is a stone throw away, so he shows up and he does his thing, and uh and it, and so you have Lots people. Of artisans. Yeah, and... you, you you see all these people walking around in costume. And there are steam trains there, and you get you have lunch with them, and it, you it's... see the odd Amish person like wandering in, going, <laughs> "Yeah, he's yeah. English, are strange." Yeah. <laughs> um, we've also had we've also had some great uh, we've also done some great events uh, in in, um, in uh, uh, Detroit. Detroit. We we're, we're going back to Detroit. We had a we did a terrific event a few years ago called Up in the Ether, and now it's morphed into Motor City Steam Con. Yeah, Motor City Steam Con. We're looking forward to that this summer. Uh, but I think of all the different steampunk events, mm -hmm. places that we've been to, and I tell every steampunk I meet, I'm like, save your nickels, save your dimes, get to New Zealand, go to the <laughs> South Island. Oh, yes. And in the South Island, there's this little mining town called Amaru. And they have basically, the steam, the, the, they've taken over the they've, town. They've taken, they've they taken own over that the place. Town. Uh, we, we, um, we, we, there was this wonderful jeweler there. His name is, uh, Ian, uh, his name is, uh, Clark, Ian Clark. Yes. Uh, he goes by the name of Agent Darling. <laughs> and he heard that we were, we were passing through and he said, well, would you like to get together? We'll get some of the local punks together and we'll have coffee. I said, okay, why not? We were thinking four or five people. Heck, we'll show up in costume, walk around for a few fun. hours. It'll be fun. We get there. There are 20 steampunks there. <laughs> They're all awesome. decked out. They're all decked out. I mean, and and on There's top. There's a woman of, riding an actual 1904 motorized little bike. bicycle. Bicycle. Um, oh my gosh. The the local paper was there, and we were featured on their front page. Oh cool. Um, but that's that is pale in comparison, because then we spent the day just walking around, and they have a steampunk playground. They have a <laughs> steampunk cafe. Then they've got steampunk HQ, which is this old Victorian building that they turned into the only way I can describe it is orange. a clockwork orange meets steampunk, meets steampunk <laughs> with a little bit of twilight zone. And it's a hands-on modern art exhibit. Mm -hmm. And it is fascinating. It is imaginative. It is gleefully fun and insanely creepy all at the same time. And uh, it's, it's, I mean, <clears throat> I can't think of any other town they, that is owned by steampunk. They call the themselves, way. yeah, they call themselves the steampunk capital of the world. And you think, wow, that's, that's pretty, that's, that's, a, big that's, that's a big claim. <laughs> well, let me put you this way. We, we said, you know, Pip said, how long do you think we're going to stay there? And I said, well, you know what? We're going to be in costume. It's going to be, it's going to be kind of warm. Yeah, a couple of hours. Maybe a couple of hours. We'll leave it, you know, we'll get there at nine, have coffee, walk around till 11, 12 o'clock tops. We didn't leave there until four o'clock. Oh. And the only reason we left was because we had, we had reservations at this resort somewhere else in the South Island. And as we're driving away, I remember Pip said, she said, I don't want to leave. <laughs> I'm going to spend another night in, in Amaru. And she said, I never thought I'd say that about Amaru. <laughs> when I was like growing up, Amaru was not the most exciting city in the world. Or little, it's a little town by the ocean with wonderful white stone buildings and fantastic but steampunks they, everywhere. But, I mean, they, gave, with steampunk. they gave me, they gave me a VIP tour of the local distillery. That's how they made you to be. And, you uh, yeah, but I mean, they had, it, it was just, it was just an amazing town. And for when, when they say that they are the steampunk capital of the world, they're not kidding. No, they're not. Well, so we, we haven't been, but there is a great event in June that is hosted there. Um, some of our friends have been like Mount Montague Jacques yeah, Fromage Montague Jacques has Fromage. been down there where, where they literally blow it up big. Uh, it's, it's uh, teapot what, racing. When it shows up. When it shows up, they do costumes. They just, they take it completely over. I don't know what they do with the locals, run them out. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's definitely, that was definitely one of the highlights and, and Steampunk Unlimited, I think. Is, yeah. You know, Sounds incredible. Well, oh my goodness, I love chatting with you. You're awesome. <laughs> really, you really are. Um, um, if I wasn't already in love with Steampunk, you're right. Just listening to you would just draw me in. So you guys are great. But we are getting down to the end of the show. But I wanted to ask, for those that are just entering into the field, they want to write Steampunk. They, they're learning a little bit about it. What, what would be some just basic things you would want them to know? 
Well, I think um, before you start, think about how the technology is going to influence the culture and the history, if you're using a his historical base to go from. Because uh, I, there's a wonderful YouTube yeah. song by our friend Jeff Lee called Just Glue Some Gears On It and Call It Steampunk. Yeah. Now, you don't want to be accused of that right. so, as a writer. <laughs> so, um, do, if you're doing historical base, do your research, know what you're basing everything off. And think about, definitely think about how the technology is going to impact the culture and how the culture is, you know, it's, it's that glue that binds the two things together you yeah. have to think about. Yeah. Awesome. Um, I think also too, uh, the, the, at, at the core, there should be a really solid story. There really has to be a good story um, because you can't go any further with that. And if you, if you find out that, that the best way to tell the story is by doing it in steampunk, then, you know, you're, you're in the 19th century. If you decide, I want to do steampunk, but I want to do it on a different world, go ahead, do it on a different world. If you decide that instead of it being, uh, being steampunk, you want, to, you want to advance it by a few decades, maybe make it atom punk or make it, uh, make it diesel punk, that's okay too. What matters in the end is that you've got, a, you've got good characters and you've got a good story. Otherwise, you've just got a real fancy you, you, you got you got fancy gadgets and and a real nice setting but but the the author feels like, i'm sorry the reader feels like they're on the outside looking in mm -hmm. and you want to bring them in you want to get them to know you want them to know these characters and you want them to feel bad when they when they reach the end of the book so you want um, a good solid base yeah mm -hmm. very cool thank you so much Thank you both for joining me this evening. Where can everyone touch bases with you? Grab copies of your books, check out your podcast. Well, we have one home base where you can find all the social media links and book links and podcast links and links to him and me. Uh, ministryofpeculiaroccurrences.com is where you can find all of those fine things. And then uh, if you're interested in us as separate authors because we do come separate we do come separate we're, not fans, right? um, we're a box set for events though that's, that's right you bit. get two for one in this yeah, in, yeah in we're, a... we're a two for <laughs> but uh i'm at pjballantine.com and you're at tmorris.com and then uh if you if you but if you like this if you like the two for if you if you like the double <laughs> act uh there is a there's another podcast we do called the shared desk.com and that's an entirely separate podcast. It's not steampunk. It's, it's more writerly, but it's the two of us riffing on the mics. And sometimes we bring in guests. Sometimes we, it's just the two of us. But we, we, talk about, we talk about the writer's lifestyle. And then we also, we also get geeky. And we talk about everything from uh, the latest episode of Penny Dreadful we saw to what we got in Loot Crate. So <laughs> yeah, it's basically we just hang out and talk on the microphone. Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> but we aren't wearing fancy costumes. We right. we don't, we don't, yeah, we don't podcast in this gear. I'm afraid not. We don't podcast. In this gear. <laughs> well, we're just so glad, and I'm so honored that you both uh, stopped by today. Thank you so much for hanging out with us, and we just wish you the best with your releases and everything that is going on. Thank you so much, and everyone that is out there. Thank you so much for hanging out. We just. Um, glad that you you know joined us, and we just hope that you have a wonderful day evening morning whenever you're watching this <laughs> why because you deserve it have a good one everyone bye-bye <laughs>